Good afternoon to all of you, and thank you for joining us. Um, for a and a very special thank you to Secretary General Amagro, Under Secretary Fernandez, Ambassador Salazar for being with us today, and of course Assistant Secretary Nichols. We so appreciate you co-hosting this event again and maintaining our partnership that now spans more than half a century. It's so good to be back in this beautiful room at the State Department after three long years and actually having people sitting next to me as opposed to a Zoom. Isn't this exciting? Um, I now have the great privilege of introducing our first keynote speaker for today's program, Senator Bill Hagerty. I am so pleased that Senator Hagerty accepted our invitation to speak today because there is really no one better who represents what the Council of the Americas stands for, the powerful partnership, the private sector, and the governments to strengthen democracy and prosperity across the hemisphere. Senator Hagerty is a businessman and an investor by profession. At the same time, he has always been committed to public service. And in both his business and public service careers, he has always engaged internationally. Senator Hagerty took time off from his successful business ventures to serve as a member of the governor's cabinet in his home state of Tennessee, and also as commissioner of the Tennessee Department of Economic and Community Development. Before he was elected in 2020 as U.S. Senator for Tennessee, he served as the U.S. Ambassador to Japan. He is a member of the Senate Foreign Relations um, Committee, and he recently returned from leading a bipartisan CODEL uh, to meet with, the gov with government and business leaders in Japan. And for all of you, and for Senator Hegarty, a little known fact, I actually know your state very well. My two of, both of my children went to Vanderbilt, and I would drive every year from New York across to Vanderbilt across the state of Tennessee, and I've probably done that eight to 10 times. <laughs> So, this is particularly important for me. Importantly, though, for all of us, Senator Hagerty's international experience includes extensive work in and on Latin America. So it's truly a pleasure to have you with us today, Senator, and we look forward to hearing from you. Um, I didn't realize you had the Vanderbilt connection. Oh, yeah. That's great. You picked a wonderful school and a wonderful state. <laughs> Susan, thank you for that kind introduction. It's great to be back in these halls again. It's been some time since I've been here, but it's wonderful to be back. Uh, I want to also thank Andres Gluski, Chairman of the America Society and the Council of the Americas, and Eric Farnsworth, the Vice President of the Council of Americas, for all that you do, including organizing today's event. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to speak here today at the Washington Conference of the Americas as it convenes for its 52nd time. And it's a pleasure for me to return to the State Department after serving as the 30th Ambassador of the United States to Japan. As U.S. Ambassador, it was very clear to me that peace and prosperity flourish when America and her allies flourish together. So as a United States Senator, I'm going to use my position to continue to work with this administration to support stronger alliances in the face of what I see as mounting global threats. In my remarks today, I'm going to touch on three things. First, I want to provide some context for why I see the Western Hemisphere as being so critical. Second, I want to discuss some of the biggest challenges facing the United States and our neighbors. And then third, I want to talk about how we can work together to solve these problems. First, let me give you a little bit of my personal background to put my viewpoint into context. I began my career that spanned five continents working for a firm called the Boston Consulting Group that included a multi-year stint in Japan, uh, not knowing I'd come back later to serve in a different capacity. Then I worked in private equity and in venture capital, uh, building businesses and creating jobs in a way that I think changed people's lives. I subsequently served as the head of Tennessee's Department of Economic Development. For those of you that aren't familiar with a department like that, it's essentially the Trade and Commerce Department for our state. And in that capacity, I helped transform our state. 
Tennessee has become one of the most booming economies in the nation right now. We're a terrific hub for logistics, transportation. We've accomplished that by focusing on creating an environment for business that rewards capital investment. We've seen good jobs come into our state, and as a result of good jobs, we've seen many social problems resolved. As U.S. Ambassador to Japan, I brought that same sort of results-oriented approach to our relationship with Japan and to our work in the Indo-Pacific region. And as I think about what we accomplished during my time in Tokyo, we got a lot of things done. We elevated the U.S.-Japan alliance to new heights. We worked with our allies in Japan and with members on the United Nations Security Council to impose the strongest economic sanctions ever on North Korea. We strengthened America's quad security dialogue with Japan, with India, and with Australia. We pushed back against the Chinese Communist Party One Belt, One Road initiative across the globe and particularly in that region. And we worked closely with the U.S. Trade Representative to negotiate the U.S.-Japan Free Trade Agreement. That free trade agreement included a very high standards U.S.-Japan digital trade agreement. And I think that that U.S.-Japan digital trade agreement can serve as a model for digital trade throughout the globe with our allies. As U.S. Senator, I'm dedicated to bringing that same sort of results-oriented approach to the challenges and the opportunities that face us today in the Western Hemisphere. Indeed, I've made the strategic decision to prioritize the Western Hemisphere in my work in the Senate. I did so because our closest neighbors in the Western Hemisphere directly affect the security and prosperity of us right here in America, as well as it does to those of our neighbors. As U.S. Senator, I see the border crisis at the southwest border of the United States and the northern border of Mexico as the biggest national security, economic, and humanitarian challenge that the United States and our immediate neighbors could have faced. That's why I chose to lead in May of 2021 what was the first congressional delegation to any foreign country after the pandemic. My congressional delegation visited Guatemala and Mexico, in fact, one month before Vice President Harris made that trip. My purpose was to discuss the American people's grave concerns about the border crisis and how our nations can work together to end it. In Guatemala, I was honored to meet with President Alejandro Giamate and his top officials for very frank and very productive discussions. And I also thank them for continuing to be a diplomatic ally to our strategic partner in Taiwan. In Mexico, I was delighted to meet with Economy Secretary Tatiana Clotier, with Foreign Secretary Marcelo Ebrard, and in both countries, I also made it a point to meet with dozens of industry leaders because we need the government and the private sector to work together if we want to effectively solve problems. My message to them was twofold. First, to discuss the grave and growing challenge that illegal immigration, drug trafficking, and human trafficking pose to all of our nations including those nations that are trying to seek foreign investment, trying to obtain modern infrastructure, and want to create jobs through economic growth. And I wanted them to understand that my strong belief is that if the United States and our neighbors boldly seize the opportunity to stem the immediate crisis with an eye toward the future, we can advance security, prosperity, and human dignity for all of our people. I want to talk now about some of the challenges that Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party are posing to the world and in particular, to the Western Hemisphere. Whoop, are we okay? Everybody okay there? <laughs> in particular, I want to focus on the crisis at our southwest border and China's failure to stop the flow of fentanyl and its precursors to Mexico, which is creating an holy marriage between the CCP and the billion-dollar illegal Mexican drug cartels. This problem is destabilizing my country, and it's destabilizing many neighbors in our region. Last month, I led a delegation of Tennessee law enforcement officials to visit the border and see the problem firsthand. It's a travesty in terms of the flow of narcotics coming across the border. China's refusal to stop the flow of fentanyl and its precursors into the Western Hemisphere is killing our children in the United States and in neighboring countries. In the United States today, the number one cause of death for young people between the ages of 18 and 45 is drug overdoses. 100,000 American lives were lost just last year to drug overdoses, most of it from fentanyl. The U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency continues to assess that the fentanyl flowing from China into Mexico is the major cause of this. In conversations with senior Mexican officials, I learned that Chinese entities are sending technicians, they're sending equipment, they're setting up production in partnership with Mexican cartels there. 
And make no mistake, these cartels are multi-billion dollar industries that have basically taken control of the northern border of Mexico. On our side of the border, I saw the technology that we must put in place as soon as possible to scan cargo containers and detect in a very sophisticated manner where illegal substances like fentanyl and their precursors may be hidden. The Biden administration should work together with Mexico and other neighbors in the region to ensure that we all have these sorts of scanning and detection technologies in place. We need to help our respective national authorities effectively curb the smuggling of fentanyl, fentanyl precursors, and the machinery to produce fentanyl that is flowing from China into our hemisphere. But the United States and our neighbors must also keep pressing China itself to stop the illegal flows. In December of 2018, I was on the phone with senior White House staff when President Trump, during the Buenos Aires G20 summit, directly asked President Xi to stop sending fentanyl to the United States. We made some progress. And when Secretary of State Tony Blinken testified before the Senate Appropriations Committee last week, he and I discussed the need to double down on the CCP's smuggling of fentanyl and its precursors. I said in that meeting that if Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party can shut down a city the size of Shanghai, as they've recently done, that's one of the three largest cities in the world, I would think that they certainly could shut down the flow of fentanyl and its precursors coming from China. I look forward to working closely with Secretary Blinken and with our neighbors in the region to end this threat. We all need to take decisive actions for the sake of our respective citizens, and especially our children, who are at the front lines of this scourge. But China poses other serious problems and long-term risks to the Western Hemisphere. When I served as U.S. Ambassador to Japan, I had a front row seat to the malign actions of Communist China. Without question, from a global perspective, the Chinese Communist Party poses the biggest threat to global security, prosperity, and human dignity in the 21st century. The CCP is using its Belt and Road Initiative to pursue debt trap diplomacy in our hemisphere and all around the world. In particular, the CCP is leveraging China's balance sheet to back and subsidize Huawei and other state-controlled and state-directed Chinese companies that pose severe national security and espionage threats to our citizens and to our data. When I served as U.S. Ambassador to Japan, I helped the United States and Japan closely coordinate on countering Huawei and other national champion Chinese companies. Our strategy was to use export controls and other measures to clear Huawei and its ilk from the 5G markets of our respective economies. This strategy prevented Huawei and other Chinese Communist Party-directed telecoms from obtaining global scale and dominating international markets. And it also created openings for firms in the US, Japan, and partner countries to pursue trusted 5G alternatives in supply chains, including software-defined networks and open radio architect networks, otherwise known as ORAN. These trusted 5G alternatives will ultimately prove to be clean, safe, and more cost competitive than the CCP alternatives. Today, I'm also working to ensure that the United States, Japan, and other advanced technological nations work closely with other countries, especially in the Western Hemisphere, to generate cost competitive and trusted alternatives to 5G in semiconductors and in other strategic technologies. This, in part, will require us to bring back more high-tech manufacturing jobs and supply chains to the United States and to the Western Hemisphere. As we all know, the massive disruptions caused by the global pandemic, which came from communist China, awakened countries and companies around the world to the need to diversify and secure manufacturing and supply chains through reshoring and nearshoring. Last year, I reached across the aisle to partner with Senator Angus King of Maine. We co-authored legislation together to reshore semiconductor manufacturing and other strategically important technological industries back to the United States. The Haggerty King legislation builds upon a successful Fast 41 permitting program that Congress established in 2015 to help companies cut through bureaucratic red tape. Our legislation will reduce the permitting process for semiconductor fabrication plants and other strategic facilities from five years down to 18 months. And the great news is, earlier this year, the Senate unanimously passed the Haggerty King bill, and we sent it to the House of Representatives. I'm working hard now with the House to get it through the House and get it to the President's desk so it can be signed into law. If our bill's enacted, it will make the United States more competitive. 
and it will help to reshore semiconductor manufacturing and other technological industries that are strategically important to all of us here in this hemisphere. In turn, and this is important, our legislation will also create powerful incentives to nearshore supply chains related to these strategic industries and away from China, back to our allies and partners here in the Western Hemisphere. Not every job will come back to America, though I work very hard to make that happen. But to the extent that they don't, we'd be working hand in hand together with our neighbors in the Western Hemisphere to bring these jobs and their critical supply chains back to our region. Together, we'll become safer, more secure, and more prosperous. As I said earlier, when I got elected to the United States Senate, I made the strategic decision to prioritize the Western Hemisphere, and I mean it. As a lifelong businessman, as a former U.S. diplomat, and now as a U.S. Senator, I want to work with all of you to solve problems right here in our neighborhood. We need to work together because if we don't solve our problems, nobody else will. We owe it to the citizens of our respective nations whom it's our duty to serve. We owe it to each other as good neighbors, and we owe it to our children who will inherit our hemisphere and our world. Let's work together and make the Western Hemisphere known as the hemisphere of security and prosperity for the 21st century. Thank you again for having me here today, and may God bless you all.